The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the house, malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Although it's not one of our readings for today, uh, today's story got me thinking about the book of Revelation. Revelation is full of a lot of striking images. To me, one of the most interesting is in chapter 18. John has just spent all this time painting this picture of the great harlot, Babylon, drunk on the blood of prophets and martyrs and sitting astride a terrible seven-headed beast. In chapter 18, John narrates the death of the harlot, She's destroyed by the very beast upon which she rides, the source of all her power and security. Now, with all that's come before this, one would think that the people of earth would rejoice with the angels at the downfall of Babylon and the end of her bloodthirsty reign. Instead, what follows this scene is a dirge, a funerary lament of her death, sung by all the kings and the peoples of earth who mourn her absence. We're left wondering, what's wrong with these people? How could they love something so hideous and abominable? Now, the harlot, we know, is intended as a symbol for Rome, the great world superpower of John's day. With that in mind, it's easy to figure out why John imagined why all the people conquered and subjugated by Rome would still lament her downfall. For all the slavery and exploitation, for all the frivolous excesses contrasted with abject poverty, Rome was beloved for one thing especially, the Pax Romana, the famous Roman peace. The provinces may have grimaced at having to pay Roman taxes and having their sons and husbands conscripted into Rome's legions, but at the end of the day, they fiercely coveted and appreciated the safety and the order ensured by those taxes and soldiers. The Pax kept them safe from all the thieves and bandits lurking around every corner, protected them from the bad hombres on the other side of their borders. The Pax may have come with a heavy price, but it was one that they were willing to pay. Today, we still value our Pax. Ours is a Pax of law and order, of civility and decency. In these recent weeks, we've been chagrined to hear of the breakdown of that law and order. Of course, there have been the protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, but even before that, many cities saw groups of protesters demonstrating against stay-at-home orders mandated to combat the COVID pandemic. 
Life has us all off balance these days. And when mixed together with isolation and boredom and stress, that dis-ease has begun bubbling to the surface in public shows of anger and frustration. But of course, these problems are not new. The stay-at-home protests were, have been organized by people worried about the economy, which means people worried about their ability to provide for their families and their future. That fear that has lurked, that is a fear that has lurked beneath the surface of the American dream throughout our entire history, but which has become especially pronounced in these last decades as the middle class has slowly stagnated and the ultra-rich have accumulated more and more wealth. And of course, I don't need to tell you that George Floyd is only one in a long list of human lives lost to the cancer of racism. American citizens have been demonstrating, peacefully and otherwise, for far longer than the Black Lives, movement, um, Black Lives Matter movement has been around. Long before the civil rights movement of the 60s, there were riots and demonstrations and the 14th Amendment and John Brown's Rebellion. This is all simply to say that for as much as we talk about the American dream and, and pride ourselves on being the land of the free and the home of the brave, we have always been a people living in fear. Fear that somebody will come and steal away what is rightfully ours. Women demanding the right to vote. Native Americans fighting to defend their land from Western expansion. Freed slaves hoping for the same rights and privileges as their former owners. Communists trying to undermine our freedom. Refugees and immigrants coming to take away our jobs. The problems we are seeing now are nothing new. They're the same old neuroses that the first colonists brought with them across the Atlantic. These days we joke more and more that it feels like we're living in an apocalypse. And you know what? We are. The word apocalypse literally means revelation. It's like a pulling back of a curtain to expose what is uh, behind it. Jesus says to his disciples today, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. Nothing is secret that will not become known. Whatever confluence of events and circumstances has created this moment of protest and unrest and dis-ease in our world, one thing is certain. The curtain is being pulled back to reveal the, law, the ugly truth behind our beloved Pax. The truth that, go, that uh, has been true for as far back as we can remember. Our freedom and our prosperity are made possible by the exploitation of God's creation, both people and planet. When we can no longer exploit these things, we begin to see how quickly the system fails. It is into this moment that Jesus makes a promise. A promise that he comes to bring not peace, but a sword. Now that sounds like a threat, and maybe it is that too. But his words are words of hope. Unlike us gathered in our homes, mostly safe and assured that we will make it through this crisis of public health and economic disruption, the people to whom Jesus was speaking were not comfortable. They were not middle class. They had no promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jesus is speaking to all the people upon whose backs the Pax had been built, who bore its weight and fed its appetite. To these down and out people, forgotten and ignored by the powerful and privileged of their day, Jesus promises that he has come with a sword to destroy this peace, this Pax. He has come to encourage them to defy a broken and oppressive system in the hope that something new and better is coming to take its place. His words frighten us because, like all people, we want peace. We want law and order 
and decency and civility. Our problem is that we believe that we already have those things. The voices of the people filling the streets now would say otherwise. The peace that we experience now is a false peace, a pax built on the backs of the oppressed. Jesus brings with him a sword, a weapon of destruction and death to violently disrupt this false peace, to break it up and sweep it away so that a new peace can take its place. There can be no equity under the Pax Romana, for it is built on exploitation and fed with blood. It must die in order for the Pax Christi, the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, to finally be realized among us. And this is why Jesus comes bearing a sword. John pictures him carrying this sword not in his hand, but in his mouth. The sword Jesus brings is the word of God, the gospel, the good news. It is the word that proclaims freedom to the captive and restoration of sight to the blind. It is the word, as the author of the Sermon to the Hebrews says, which is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. What I say to you in the dark, Jesus says, tell in the light. What you hear whispered from uh, what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. That whispered promise of hope for God's coming reign of justice and peace, true peace, is the sword. We are the sword. We are the sword because we are the edge of Christ's peace breaking into this world, cutting through the curtain of the false peace to reveal the truth which lies concealed. We are the sword of God's word, announcing a defiant hope that the established law and order will give way to something better, something that benefits all creation, not just the powerful and the privileged. Even as we fear the destruction of our false peace, we are also the weapon that Christ wields to destroy it. These images of violence and death may make you uncomfortable. They make me uncomfortable. The God we know and worship is a God who gives life, who cares deeply for all creation. The God who marks even the, the fall of a sparrow. And yet we cannot deny that what Jesus has come to bring us is death. The death of the Pax, the death of law and order, the death of everything we have created to protect ourselves from those forces and those people who would take what we believe is rightfully ours, the death even of our very selves. We've been taught to fear death, to run and hide from it, to, er to erect walls, both symbolic and physical, to keep it out. And yet, as Paul reminds us, it is into Christ's death that we have been baptized. Death is our weapon, used against a bad hombre who threatened to take away our packs. And yet, somehow, death is also the very thing that God uses even now to bring us the peace that passes all understanding and to raise us to new life. It's not altogether unlike how a pandemic can help unmask our fears and lay them bare, creating the space for uh, social change. For all of John's gruesome, gory images in the book of Revelation, it's worth mentioning that all of his images of God's violence are actually parodies of violence that undermine the violence of the empire. Throughout the book, it is the forces of evil that steal and kill and destroy. It is God who promises justice to the slain, who invites the dead to rise up and join in the feast 
that has no end, the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's ironic then that we should so often find ourselves lamenting the destruction of the harlot by the beast that bears her instead of craning our necks to catch a glimpse of the bride to, whom, to whose feast Jesus invites us.